Welcome to the Alexander Arguez YouTube channel. This week, what are the best materials for learning a language? And next, how to develop the self-discipline for learning a language. Thank you for watching. Talk about uh, materials first, and then uh, discipline. So, all right, so where were we? We were saying that uh, with the, the scope of current interest polyitis that you're coming to me here right now you've got kind of an idea for about nine or ten languages that you would like to be able to read or know also mm -hmm. we've developed a scheme for saying in terms of the time and energy if we go right now you're already doing latin and greek so you're two hours a day roughly let's build from that um uh, so we're working up to five hours a day uh, after about four years of of adding in different languages. And we'll need to talk about how to develop the stamina and the the energy to, to do that. Um, so, uh, yeah, if we talk about materials again, um, that that's a, a question that uh, as you get more experience and you get more learning, um, you'll you'll know what works for you, you know, what kind of materials work best for you. But. Um, and I know that even these days, there's so many new things out there on, you know, that, 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 that all these different apps and different types of, you know, maybe even artificial intelligence or different ways of, of learning languages um, that, frankly speaking, I, I just, I, I don't know anything about my language, what we're talking about. I haven't, I, my language learning, learning, like going through didactic materials, that ended a long time ago. So I'm kind of old fashioned. I've got my books here and I know they work really well. And I, I haven't seen anything to convince me that oh well this this these these other things are actually an improvement over them they they don't seem like they are frankly um so if you are learning for literature anyway then and you want bookish advice then i'm the person to come to but if you want up to date you know about what app to use i i i know nothing i'm totally ignorant um so yeah i do i do think uh, what you're saying right there is true like i do think like for me me for example like i come to you because i i, I don't like the uh play this app all day advice you know yeah. i want your your taste for how to do this you know what i'm saying yeah so i i really do think that there's something to be said for the quality of books uh you know writing and doing a lot doing as much as you can with like pen and paper and books um just to be away from being, you know, at, at, at least a modicum of digital detox. You think of it that way. If you're studying for five hours a day, you're, you're digital detoxing five hours a day for reading books. So uh, that's a good thing to do. Um, of course, there's so much we can get, you know, books on screen. But if you've got a, a tone in your hands, then you can spend five hours a day, you know, away uh, from from the screen. So that's, uh, and I think that affects the the learning better. I just think that the, your ability to concentrate and focus as well as just sort of the, the quality of the material itself could be digitized, I guess. Um, at any rate, um, so you already have your materials going for, for Latin. We're, you know, moving through other natural methods towards, you know, towards readers and things. And we can start looking at medieval tales and all sorts of materials. So we're, we're getting there. Um, Greek. So again, we're starting Koine Greek, which again, we can use the uh, so the later form of Greek. If you really want to get into Greek, if you really want to read Plato or Aristotle, you need to learn something other, another form. And that will be, that's another thing that will, again, when you, when you appreciate these languages diachronically and in terms of the literature and wanting to know them more profoundly, you'll, you'll find other interests. But Greek is another language that has, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, goes back to the oldest texts that we have, 7th, 8th century BC till now. And there's, you know, different stages. There's Archaic Greek and Homeric Greek and Attic Greek and Koine Greek and Byzantine Greek and different kinds of modern Greek. Uh, um, but there's more continuity with Greek than with a lot of other languages. So that will be an interesting thing for you to explore uh, in the future. But um what we're starting with really is we got a, 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 got a good self teacher, self, you know, autodidact manual for, for sort of going over the structure of the language systematically, but also just working with the interlinear text of the, of the gospels of the new Testament. Um, so I think that's an answer to your question too. If you want to get to materials that, you know, use, um, you know, getting to literature faster, the sooner you can avail yourself of these kind of interlinear texts or of bilingual texts, the, the better and the more you can learn by comparing and sort of doing your own work. So 
if you are really learning for literature for that kind of sake, you don't need to spend so much time on a grammar book, um, so much time, you know, going through every nuance and wanting to be perfect, sure that you're, you're you got it quite right. You can plunge yourself into the reading sooner. So um, you can, um, uh, if you really want to know a language well, I use the term peeling the onion, you need to work through several different manuals. But uh, after you've done that, uh, or, you know, or if you can also make those manuals be that sort of bilingual text type thing, um, then you can uh, you can do that all the more. So we're starting that with with Greek, and I think that will work well there. Um, and then I said uh, French and German were the next ones that you were going to add. So uh, again, with these old-fashioned methods that I've always talked about, take your pick. I've made old videos about them. I've got them. If you ever can, you know, look at the the, the ones I have in my library. There's Asimil, which is a French company. Uh, there's Linguaphone, which is a British company. Um, there's uh, Berlitz, the older Berlitz, 1940s, 50 Berlitz, uh, which have like the same narrative structure of uh, it's sort of a story. So you learn through the story. So if you use that, for example, to learn, uh, you can use that to learn French, German, Spanish, uh, and Italian. So definitely, like if you were to learn one of those languages, Italian or Spanish, with um, with with that method, actually looking at comparing it, I think you could just sort of listen to and actually read the story in Spanish because it's interlinear and just sort of uh, pick it up um, the uh, the other way. So uh, those would be things to consider. The uh, the linguaphone has, uh, if you use the sort of 1960s versions of them, they've got parallel. Um, not stories, but it's exactly the same in in each language. So it's like, this is my living room. This is my this is my uh, here's my piano. This is my neighbor's living room. This is my neighbor's wife's piano. And now let's compare. Let's talk through. And it gets more and more complex. But you also sort of like it's really interesting to see. Oh, I just learned this in this language, and now I learn it in that language. And you can sort of say, oh, I can say the same thing, you know, and this is a way of training your, training your memory, training the discipline of your memory uh, to see sort of across, and, you know, just always comparing and contrasting how they're different and how they're, how they're similar. So um, those are, are good for that. Uh, but again, the, the Asimil is the one that has in one book, the bilingual text, and it's originally in French, but you can get most of them translated into German. So again, so for the Russian, you definitely want to use sort of like the Russian Asimil Russian uh, to, to have with that. Um, yeah. With these others, yeah, if you're, if you're bookish in that sense, you have them. Uh, again, Middle English, just a good bilingual text for Chaucer. Uh, and uh, Biblical Hebrew, I mean, you've got a totally different alphabet to learn. You've got a totally different structure, a totally different set of, of, of vocabulary, very, very different um, structure of the language. Um, so that's going to be really interesting and, and mysterious, but uh, I think you just have to, again, if we're holding that off to be one of your, your last languages when you're most experienced and you have got some down in, in my basement, I've got some, I think I have a couple of biblical Hebrew, but I wouldn't know which one to recommend off of that, but that's one that you're going to have to probably spend more time, you know, just going through different different textbooks and, and just practicing that and slowly, uh, slowly but surely building that up. Yeah. Um. I guess, I don't know if this is the right question to ask now, but like, I was wondering if based off all the languages you see me having, uh, is there any, do you think there's any holes in it? Anything you think I'd find interesting, uh, st like stimulating in any way uh, that you, you think I'm just missing out on uh, with these languages? Um, I think that, again, just... I'm not maybe I'm just projecting myself onto you. If you're interested in comparative historical linguistics, if you're interested in literature, again, just seeing these other stages, like I was always talking about, seeing the different stages of Greek will be interesting. You know, uh, maybe you've mentioned, you know, you've got French, maybe you learn some old French. If you've got Middle English and Modern English, why not learn some Old English? So um, you might want to sort of extend yourself uh, a, a bit more. You also mentioned that there's, you know, Danish, Port again, Portuguese, you should get in the bargain at this point. Danish uh, shouldn't really be any 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 kind of a challenge at, at this point. So um, you would just be looking at in terms of holes, you're saying, well, again, that's the more languages I have, the more I need to juggle, the less I can devote to this and the less I can devote to that, or the more hours can I somehow, you know, somehow beg, buy, borrow, or steal more time for this. Um, but 
at this point, I think maybe, yeah, you would uh, just enjoy reading. I mean, Catalan is, 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 has a fascinating literary tradition. I think the other Romance languages, the other Germanic languages, at a certain point, they become accessible and you might sort of want to, you know, just explore them one by one and see if one of them really catches your fancy and, and give a bit more time to it. Um, but I would just say that looking at your list, maybe, you know, as you said, you know, you're mostly interested in, in European languages and stuff. So looking at your list, you don't, yeah, you're, you're, you're all European languages. So maybe you might get interested in something from another continent, another culture, another, uh, another, another civilization. So, I mean, there's plenty of ancient languages. You could go back and learn ancient Egyptian. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's hieroglyphs. Those might, you know, be interesting to you or ancient Mayan. They've also got a hieroglyphic writing system. So you might get interested in, totally uh different kind of language there uh, uh sumerian or akkadian like babylonian you know the, the bible mentions these other peoples who were in the middle east for a lot longer so we've got texts for all these the assyrians so uh, if you're interested in older languages there are plenty of older languages that uh, haven't you know that i think there's actually probably a fair amount to do with those um because there aren't that many people that go into it and i think that there are a fair amount of probably untranslated play tablets written in these Assyrian or Babylonian texts. Uh, I want to look into that uh, for older languages. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you might, once you've got Latin and, and Greek, um, one of the interesting discoveries in the late 19th century was of the, that Sanskrit also was very closely related to Latin and Greek. And Sanskrit is like the, the Latin of, of Indian civilization. And so you might get curious to say, well, if I can learn a language that's also like a sister to Latin and Greek and is also going to open up another rich literature, you might want to add that. Um, if you're studying, I don't know, uh, yeah, studying studying more broadly, if you're thinking, you know, if I want to uh, deal with the fact that, that, that the majority of people in the world now are going to be speaking, what, Mandarin uh, or you know, there's a lot of people who are speaking these languages and maybe I'll have some inter, you know, an interaction with them or some desire to read ancient you know, classical Chinese is another, you know, really, really thing. And then there's Arabic. Arabic is, uh, um, in terms of having a very rich literature, philosophical tradition, stuff like that. I mean, it was the scholarly language of the, of the like sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth centuries. Uh, and there's a lot of loan words in English that we don't even know that are from Arabic, like chemistry and and things like this come alchemy and and uh, other things. Uh, Spanish has a fair amount of Arabic loan words in it, so maybe you'll notice that if you're learning Spanish and Portuguese, hey, this is Arabic loan words, and then you know, well, Arabic actually had this influence. We do have Arabic words from a long time ago uh, and has a big influence on in these. And oh, Arabic has an influence on probably more languages across the globe than any other language. If you think of uh, geographical extent, um, different types of language families and different numbers of people who speak these languages, you can go from Africa, Swahili and, and lots of other languages or have a lot of Arabic influence and all the way through Northern Africa, the Berber languages, Turkish, Turkish, Turkic languages, all the other languages of the Caucasus, any form of Persian, that's Farsi, Dari, Tajik, uh, any other of the, the Turkic languages like uh, Kazakh or um, lots of Indic languages, Urdu and Bengali, you know, as the sort of the, 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 the states where Islam is predominant, but even Hindi and you know, which is trying to take uh, Urdu and and uh, and and I'm sorry, Persian and Arabic words out and substitute Sanskrit words for it. Whereas Urdu is now trying to take Sanskrit words out and putting in Persian and Arabic words. So the governments are kind of driving them apart, but they're sort of really the same language. But yeah, other Indic languages have Arabic words, and then into Indonesia and and Southeast Asia. So um, if you're thinking of like the word for literature talk about reading literature, that's probably going to be adab, which is from Arabic, and it's probably going to be the same in pretty much most all of those languages. So that's an incredible, if you're talking about like, what language is going to give you the most bang for your buck? If I learn this language, you know, it's going to make it easier for me to learn lots of other languages. That would be, uh, that would be a good one. But Arabic is incredibly hard. Arabic, you know, if we're talking about this, <clears throat> you know, realistically to learn a language like Arabic or, 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 Chinese or Korean or Japanese, um, 
you, you, you need to go there and live there and you need to stay there for a long time. Uh, you need to spend like 10, 15 to, to really become feeling comfortable with, with it. I, I lived for about nine years total in Korea and about total uh, in between Lebanon and the United Arab Emirates, about nine years in uh, sort of trying to be in an Arabic speaking environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, I've got real substantial abilities in them, but they're never going to be like these European languages at the same level, even if I stayed a lot longer. And, you know, it's like I'm very situational. I can read this kind of thing, but not that kind of thing so much. And um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, you have to immerse yourself in it and spend yourself up in a long time and know that you're still going to be, you know, not as, as, as adept as you are in, in, say European languages, but they're fascinating. They're, they're, the, they're the key languages to these civilizations and again to, to other etymologies. So dang, you made it you made a very convincing case for <laughs> I'm definitely interested now. Uh Sanskrit too seemed really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I know you had no. said more like Latin, ancient Chinese, Sanskrit, and Arabic, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Or like if you're gonna learn like I guess like Pareto principle languages like yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And we have a number of people here in the, in the academy um, who are, you know, that's that's their goals. Like, I want to learn that, that my list. I want these four languages. I want to, you know, the, the core classical languages. So, again, um, classical Chinese, uh, the 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 characters, they form the etymology of like 70 percent of Korean and Japanese, which each have, you know, about 100 million people or more um, and, and lots of stuff to to read in it. Um, and all the different kinds of Chinese, I guess we call them dialects, but they're, you know, might be languages different, you know, they, they supposedly all write the same way, but they don't sound the same way, but there's sort of a unity. So if you look at the, uh, the words that are come out of classical Chinese, they have a huge influence in terms of like numbers of people. And this is numbers of people who've written numbers of books. So, uh, I think that, uh, classical Chinese is sort of the, the etymological key to East Asia. Um, I think Sanskrit is the etymological key to not just India, but uh, cultures that have been influenced by it. So into Southeast Asia too, uh, uh, where Hinduism and Buddhism went. Uh, these things were translated, a lot of translations from Sanskrit into Tibetan. Steve can talk about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that you know that you know that, that when you tra when you, massive translation projects result in massive borrowing, massive influence of one language to another. Um, so Sanskrit probably has a, a wider geographical range uh, that I'm aware of. But even just with you know the Indic languages with Hindi and and Urdu and stuff like that, that's a really rich treasure trove. But like I said, I think Arabic has the biggest span um, mm. because. Now English and before French and before Latin itself were sort of the the international languages. Um, the a lot of international words come ultimately from Latin. So Latin is kind of like peppered throughout the world. You know, it's uh, but you know, so absolutely the most influential language in in Europe. Uh, again, like I said, about seventy percent of of Korean and Japanese come from classical Chinese. Well, about seventy percent of English comes from latin ultimately either directly from latin or through um french and, and other languages uh so it's had an incredible influence on an english uh on a lot of uh, not that high a degree on, on a lot of other languages but still like 30 40 percent depending on, on the language obviously latin is transformed into the romance languages so i'm talking about having an influence on the germanic languages there's a lot of latin words in in russian so you're going to find its influence everywhere yes sir um, once again, I'm not sure if this is the right time to ask this question either, but ancient Greek, uh, whenever you're going through the materials for that one, it was, it was interesting to me. Like, I know you say it's basically all Greek, but is there a strategy for going through the, like, I'm most interested in ancient, mm -hmm. I would say, then probably Koine, uh, or no, I, I actually don't know all the ones, but like, I'd want to be able to read from like Homer to. I guess like before Koine really easily. And then mm -hmm. Koine is like lesser for me. Uh uh yeah, I don't know. Like what would what would be your strategy for that? And also is that a good one to uh to like study simultaneously? Like would you recommend I do while we're doing New Testament, 
go study like Athena Zay. I know Sean's kind of doing that. Uh, stuff like that. Um, I think that that is something, that, again, you'll just need to figure out. First, see how it's just going doing Latin and Greek together. But here's the strategy. I don't know if you can see it. It's too small. But this is another thing. This is um, Die Griechische Literatur in Text und Darstellung. So Greek literature uh, in text and presentation. So this is, like I said, this is a German edition. And if you could learn German well enough to use this, you'd be using this. You've got Greek on one side, German on the other side. So um, this here is uh, the archaic period. You have two volumes for the classical period, uh, one volume for Hellen Hellenistic period. So that's basically getting into Koine and then the, 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 the imperial period. So this is like maybe a thousand years of Greek uh, reading. And so yes, you would probably should and could have a reference grammar and, uh, and a textbook to uh, you know, where it explains anything you find particularly difficult. But if you start and you know, you've got one form in you, you know how to read the alphabet. So if you're learning to read the alphabet with Koine, then you could just go back to this early one. And again, if your German is good enough, you can really compare or then get an English person. If you really, you know, compare and can do this and you've learned that sort of curiosity to figure out how the language works, you can do a lot by by reading again with with reference to textbook using an interlinear text or a bilingual text, you can really get a, a lot out of that. So once you learn how to read the language and you have access to reference books that will explain, give you an overview of, oh, what was different? What changed? You can get that. People know that. It shows, well, what changed between the archaic period and the classical period? What changed between the, you can have that succinctly explained to you. So you can say, well, I learned the Koine. So what happened to you? Oh, these are the new rules that I need to learn. These are the new things that just sort of work your way through that so um yeah sort of a chronological read like this would be something you could do well, there's almost no right or wrong place to start it's just start somewhere with greek and you can kind of work your way to the the other place as you see fit yeah 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 i think um honestly if you if you wanted to if you were if you had a life's project with greek it would probably make most sense to start with modern greek because that's something then you could hear it i mean if you're talking about learning how to read these languages I don't know if you're developing it yet, but you need to have a different voice in your head reading. You need to, when you're reading it, you need to hear yourself speaking it. You need to hear yourself thinking in this language. <clears throat> um, and so developing that voice is easier if you can, you can hear it sounding real and authentic. So um, you can hear modern Greek. You can hear people actually speaking. It. And so if you use that, oh, okay, I can speak like this. You can get sort of a Greek voice in your head that sounds authentic and real and alive. And then if you work backwards with that, um, sort of change it at those stage. Seems like a, a good plan.